terrifying biblical angels and a drunken man cursing God, it must be a Netflix adaptation of a beloved children's classic. I'm Chris Goodmakers and I'm here to explore the new Guillermo del Toro adaptation of Pinocchio. The Mexican filmmaker has a long and pretty varied career dating back to his innovative work in horror and even the superhero genre. However, after a while it is easy to see what the director likes. One of these things is eyeballs in places they really shouldn't be. The latest version of his persistent and reoccurring nightmare is the sister spirits, both voiced by a possible actual immortal being known as Tilda Swinton. The spirit sisters resemble more biblical depictions of angels and ancient deities. Putting aside Catholicism, Del Toro used a very similar design in his superhero sequel, Hellboy the Golden Army. The winged being in that film was also death, offering Hellboy a second chance at life despite his destiny to destroy the world. A destiny we will all see come to pass when Del Toro's Hellboy 3 finally comes out. Any day now. I mean... If the director's known for anything, it's the plethora of actually finished films he totally made. From split jaw vampires to bulbous dogfish, Del Toro loves himself some monsters. However, there is one kind of monster he absolutely hates. Fascists. The director's adaptation of the classic fable is only his latest to feature a look at the authoritative despots and the effect they have on the world around them. Del Toro moves Pinocchio's setting up from pre-modern to mid-20th century. Being set in Italy, the film actually features notorious dictator Benito Mussolini. Well, a very short version of him. Stay with the video viewer because I will get into the history of this absolutely awful human being. But for now, he is one of the many fascists the director has villainized. Going back to one of his first big budget Hollywood films, Blade 2. That film featured an ancient vampire lord whose own secret experiments gave rise to a dangerous new kind of vampire that hunted their own. Hellboy 1 and 2 also featured immortal Nazis and elf kings and even Crimson Peak had an overbearing family. However, the biggest similarities are in Pan's Labyrinth and The Shape of Water. You will be shocked to hear that after all these years, the director has finally finished a trilogy. Again, Del Toro, you promised us Hellboy 3. Instead, we got David Harbour and whatever the hell this is. Stop being a whiny little Pinocchio, along with Pan's Labyrinth and The Shape of Water, are now what I would like to dub the Fascist Dad Trilogy. When Criterion packages the three movies together under that title, I want a nickel for every DVD box set sold. What? They have a streaming channel? And no one buys DVDs anymore? Damn it, I already signed the contract! All three films feature a father who is overly strict, unloving, and downright abusive. They are dressed overly formally in a uniform or three-piece suit, they hold a high-ranking position in the authoritarian government of their time period. They get horribly maimed and usually dispatched rather brutally by the end. There's also the strong connection between Perlman's Podesta and the evil Vidal of Pan's Labyrinth. Both are members of their respective country's fascist government at the height of World War II. These aren't the only parallels between Del Toro's past and current works, but I'll leave those for later. For now, I'm sure you want something really juicy like a dirty monkey. By the time we get to the one-eyed monkey who communicates through puppets, I was already reeling from an opening that included, in this order, a small child being obliterated in a pointless air raid, a man sinking deep into alcoholism and depression until he curses God and builds a small boy while blackout drunk, a horrifying biblical angel made of flying eyeballs, Oh my god, what is that? What is that? So when Spazitora showed up, my response was something like, Oh, this movie has a salacious crumb now. However, the little simian ended up being so much more sympathetic than the cackling toady slash pet. Spazitora mostly communicates in chirps and squeaks, so only the best voice actor will do. Which is why Del Toro got storied actor Kate Blanchett. Like I did mention that the monkey does get to talk a little through his puppets, but the actress still had to make these noises. 
Also, additional fun fact about our villain turned hero monkey, his name, Spazzatura, means trash in Italian. No doubt another sign of his owner's cruelty. Also, please excuse my Italian pronunciation for this and the remaining portions of this video. The closest I've been to Italy is the time I marathoned the works of Lucio Fulci. You may be boys, but you have the hearts of men. Is there any closer relationship in filmmaking than Ron Perlman and Guillermo del Toro? The pair have worked together so often that if there was a punch card, del Toro would only be three away from a free extra Ron. This is the seventh feature the pair have collaborated on. The previous films they have worked on together are, hold, hold on, let me take a breath. Kronos, Blade 2, Hellboy, Hellboy 2, Pacific Rim, and Nightmare Alley. Oh. Oh. Let's look at another character in the movie a little closer. The evil carnival owner is played by Christoph Waltz with his distinctive voice. We must find someone else to eat all our ice cream and popcorn and hot chocolate. He tempts the wooden boy into signing a binding contract. Binding because it's so long you could physically tie someone up with it. He hounds Pinocchio throughout the film until he is finally dashed upon the rocks. Oof. So satisfying. Let's hear that 20 more times. Well, there's a lot going on in both the design and even the name of the character. Volpe in Italian means fox. This is because he is partially based on a literal fox. Or at least a literary one. Ha! Wordplay. The fox in the original story teams up with a cat to con the living puppet out of some money. Count Volpe's hair even resembles a pair of fox ears. And his cane has the head of a fox on it. Let's talk about a little bit of an odd trend that's happened lately. Recently, and I guess by recently I mean the last decade, Disney has been live actioning up its classic films. It's a trend that has given us barely expressive lions and a horrifyingly blue Will Smith. Well, Netflix isn't leaving money on the table either. Earlier this year saw the release of the Tom Hanks starring Pinocchio. That film was a direct adaptation of the classic animated feature. Del Toro's Pinocchio is more of an adaptation of the original book. Oddly, this isn't the first time this has happened, with Netflix also answering Jon Favreau's Jungle Book with Andy Serkis's Mowgli. This round goes to Netflix. Nothing in Del Toro's Pinocchio is as terrifying as those pair of dead eyes. This version is closer to the book in a lot of ways, but it takes a few big liberties. It replaces the Toyland section with an army camp that's training children to fight in a losing war. However, it does retain some references to the original tale. During the air raid, the boys are handed gas masks, which give them elongated faces. This echoes the book where Pinocchio and his friend Candlewick are turned into donkeys after making asses of themselves. Puns are fun. I said I would cycle back to the history behind the Italian dictator, and here we are. This isn't the History Channel, so I'll spare you all the extended breakdown. But the cliff notes is that he came to power as prime minister in Italy in 1923. He then turned the nation into a totalitarian police state and even made his headquarters this terrifying building. Don't worry though, because this story has a happy ending in that he was executed at the end of the war and his body spent days being assaulted by the Italian populace. Hopefully that news is a bit of a pick-me-up after the devastating ending in Del Toro's Pinocchio. Now excuse me while I go cry for a while again. Del Toro's Pinocchio is made in partnership with the Jim Henson Company of Muppet fame. So it's fitting that the storied company now holds the record for the longest stop-motion animated film of all time. It's not that surprising considering that the film has been stuck in development hell for almost a decade now. At various points, Del Toro announced the project's cancellation and restart. It didn't really come together until the Mexican director found the right collaborator. While Guillermo del Toro's name is all over this latest Netflix original, he's not the only person that had a hand in its creation. Del Toro co-wrote the script and screenplay with animator Patrick McHale. Before he teamed up with del Toro, Patrick McHale was known for the cult animated miniseries Over the Garden Wall. The 10 episode show followed two half brothers as they navigated a dark and mysterious forest on a journey home. They encountered odd creatures and dark monsters. The new film and classic limited series feature a lot of commonalities. 
There are the young protagonists lost in a big and terrifying world. There is a mix of tone in the childlike songs and the deeply terrifying beasts that threaten our heroes. It's not surprising that Del Toro saw a kinship with his own work in the animated feature, as it shares styles and themes with his own work. Besides the lead wooden boy, the legally distinct cricket, and the master craftsman, there is another character adapted out of the book. Candlewick is the young son of Ron Perlman's Podesta. By the way, Podesta is a title, not a name. Mussolini abolished all elected mayors and town councils and replaced them with a mini dictator in the form of a Podesta. So Perlman's character is basically the de facto king of Geppetto's small village. He has an equally tight grip over his son, who he describes as a model fascist youth. Candlewick is also in the classic book. He is the disobedient youth who leads the living puppet astray and eventually ends up transformed into a donkey. The adaptation reframes his disobedience as a noble trait. After a bonding experience, his father orders him to pull a kingsman on his new friend. He refuses and stands up to his father for the first time. Reframing his subservience as negative and his refusal as positive reinforces Del Toro's anti-authoritarian message. He says it's good to disobey your father, especially if he salutes like this. Yikes! Sebastian J. Cricket is the Obi-Wan voiced insect who takes up temporary residence in the wooden boy's heart. Ewan McGregor's smooth, velvety brogue. Okay, yeah, I'm getting off topic, but that accent is the reason why I've watched that otter video like 50,000 times. They go down to the bottom, they get a stone, and they go down to the bottom, they get a seashell. The cricket is constantly subject to massive physical trauma. The repeated hits are actually an allusion to his fate in the 1800s novel. In the book, he was ultimately crushed to death by Pinocchio with a hammer during a fit of rage. It's his ghost that follows the boy as a conscience. The movie even drops a hammer on him at one point. Given that he is narrating the tale from beyond the grave to a bunch of undead rabbits, he is also a ghost during this story here too, technically. Is there anyone more recreated in allegory than the big man himself? Given that this video already talks a lot about fascism, I'm gonna sidestep any further controversy and stick to talking about the history of directors having their protagonists die and then resurrect, all while striking that famous arms out pose in a not too subtle allusion to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. See literally any Superman movie ever made. Well, Del Toro can't resist putting his seemingly endless wooden boy through the same illusionary trial. However, he adds another layer to it. A plot point in the film is Geppetto and Carlo's unfinished depiction of Christ on the cross for his local Catholic church. Between this plot point and the multi-eyed angel, this is a pretty Catholic film. Just in time for Christmas. In the bombing that dispatches Carlo, the crucifix loses its right arm. It sits unfinished for years until Geppetto and Pinocchio finish it. This image is repeated when at the end of the movie, Pinocchio sacrifices himself to save Geppetto, losing his right arm in the process. Now he's off to join other famous Jesus analogies like Aslan or Robocop. For the final entry in this list, let's highlight some of the additional voice cast in the new animated feature. Voice acting is hard work, and despite how distinctive some actors' voices are, they can get lost in the shuffle. The half-decayed rabbits that spend their time in the afterlife playing cards are all voiced by Tim Blake Nelson, of Incredible Hulk fame. Hey, speaking of better movies he was in, he shares the credits once again with his Oh Brother Where Art Thou co-star, John Totoro, who plays the town doctor Dottore, which means doctor in Italian. Stranger Things star Finn Wolfhard is the young Candlewick, and Bern Gorman is the town's priest. Gorman worked with Del Toro previously on the monster versus robot film Pacific Rim. Finally, the notorious dictator himself is played by comedian Tom Kenny, a comedian to play a fool. Perfect casting. Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio is both widely different and yet strangely faithful to the classic tale of a wooden boy who yearns to be real. The cast is top notch and the animation is stunning. However, the big question I was left with was, who is this for? It's so dark and creepy that I could see enjoying it if you wanted a less stomach churning mad god, 
but its musical numbers and simple lessons make it seem like it's for kids. If you do sit down to watch this with your kids, be prepared to leave a light on at night.